Uh, so good evening everyone and welcome to a Thursday edition. A few more days left till season one is over. Welcome, welcome, welcome to FaceTime with Todd Warden. I'm your host as always, Todd Warden. I had to get a little trimmed up, you know, doing my thing uh, because it is ladies night. And of course, I have a beautiful lady coming on in a bit. And everybody started to start coming on in a bit because that's how this whole thing rolls. But let's get into some things right now. Uh, first of all, our reality check of the day, honestly, is uh, make a difference in somebody's life. And it's very simple to do. I'm going to give you a quick story. And this actually happened last night. I'm in a diner near my house. And there was a girl fighting with her man. And you can hear what she was saying to him. Like, we all heard it. The waiters, the bussers. And this woman cheated on him really bad and women and men have been cheated on but this she just went in on this guy and we just felt for him because you can hear that he didn't do anything she just just decided she fell for some dude else she was lying to him she was using his money he was watching her kids and i went through something like that when i was younger so she left you could see him crying like when you're at that stage where somebody just broke up with you and it wasn't even your fault like you feel like your world is crashing so I went over to him and I said, listen, bro, you don't know me at all. I'm not crazy. This is who I am. And I showed him, um, do you mind if I sit? And he's like, yeah. And we just started talking. And he doesn't know me from a hole in the wall because sometimes the best conversation is with the stranger. And he just opened up. And I said at the end of the day, I go, listen, we've all been through it. I've been through something similar. But it's good to get worse before it gets better. But just keep realizing every day that it wasn't you. You just were not the person for her, even though she did it wrongly. Just move on, and one day you got to find that perfect someone. You will. It may take years, but you will. I paid for his check. He's like, well, why are you doing this? I go, honestly, because sometimes people should not need somebody to come up to them and help them and expect something back. I'm just hoping he goes home and realizes it's going to hurt longer. But as time goes, it will settle, and then one day it's going to meet the right person that's going to be like you my man you know and that's to be the same way on both sides so i just want to let you guys know that that today's reality check is do something for, nice for somebody because they owed it to them now to let you know season two is going to be starting in the end of june uh celebrities are already hitting me up so you can uh email us at bookings at facetime with todd wharton show's getting bigger and we'd be more than happy to start working out dates for you because season two is already booking as i'm always doing my man hector camacho jr it's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's fighting Julio Cesar Chavez in Mexico. That's June 19th on pay-per-view. And the undercard is going to be MMA Anderson Silva versus Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. So it's a great two fights, celebrity fights. Check it out on pay-per-view June 19th and go do that. Yesterday we had a great interview with Mr. Ferrari, Manny Ancelotta. Great, great guy. You should, you should definitely watch it. He's an inspiration and he really cares about people. And I feel... He's going to have something great come out once the pandemic is done because I like what he's doing right now. Okay. Also, uh, my last show is going to be Sunday, not tomorrow. Um, I got a call from these guys right here who organized the entire DMX memorial. They drove the truck. They called me up. They love my show. They asked me if they can be on. So, of course, I'm dedicating Sunday to remembering DMX. So we'll have a promo pop out on Saturday and go into Sunday. And I'm going to interview these guys that put that whole entire thing together. And I'm honored to do that. And I I'm, I'm think it's pretty great to end the season with the remembering DMX day because he was a great guy. Speaking of a great person, I have a beautiful woman coming on. And not only did I get to talk to her briefly, but like you guys always know, when I interview people, I like to research them. And when I read her profile more and more, I was more intrigued to talk with this lady because she's done a lot of great things and she's got a beautiful heart just by what I read, the people that are around her and when I spoke to her briefly. I'm gonna show you a clip right now of this movie that she's in that just got popped out in 2020 called Beckman. So check it out as I bring her in. Close attention, my name is Eric Beckman, the preacher. It's your only chance to survive this company. I need an address and a weapon. Remember who you are. Killing this man is going to bring it back. You have to let go of the almighty control of your life. 
I turn my light on. Words. Guns. You are a dead man. That is all you understand. Then I will bring it down upon you. If I let you leave, what will you do? I want to finish what I started. That's what I'm going to do. Very, very, very cool. So, guys and ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this beautiful lady, um, award winning actress, producer, TV shows, president of the RHL group. And uh, just an all-around great woman, daytime actress. Please welcome Kira Reed Lorsch to the show. What's up? Welcome, Kira. How are you? I'm good. I decided to sit on my desk instead of behind my desk because that's just the way the setup is today. Okay, I like that because then people are going to be like, who's interviewing who? Is this Kira's show? <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? It's way? your I, show, I, and I'm happy to be here. But I felt like dwarfed behind the desk today, you know, the way it was set up. I have, yeah. you know, so I was like, I'll just be on top of the desk today. Okay. <laughs> but I I'm love that, that clip. So I wanted to see Beckman, you know. Yeah, it was great. I was looking at it. Uh, the trailer, I'm surprised. The trailer is really long. And normally trailers are like a minute. They made this trailer like two and a half minutes. And I'm just like. <laughs> uh, and I do editing, so I wanted to clean it up a little and get the parts to your end. Oh, thank you. Yeah, th there is a trailer that's the the Kira trailer, which is about a minute long on Instagram or whatever. Which is, um, you know, my Janice, my hit woman, but really a soccer mom and you know book club mom by day and an assassin by night. But uh, it was really fun to hook up with these guys because they're making an action movie, but it's also like a movie about good versus evil and about mm -hmm. um, purpose and about redemption. So it was really fun to be involved. And I'm an executive producer of this movie. And um, yeah. I got involved because I really liked the script, like a John Wick or a Taken, like a real action movie, but also just like a yeah. great message. And then when they're That's like, right. well, do you want to play this part? I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> That's a juicy, fun part to play. So I had a great time. And, and then I did well, another movie with them that's coming out in 2021. I, I have a small part in it, but I play um, kind of like I was Billy Baldwin's kind of like henchwoman in Beckman. I'm Stephen Bauer's henchwoman in Love on the Rock, which we shot in oh. Malta, of all places, during the pandemic. It was easier to go, go to Malta to shoot a movie than to yeah. shoot in Los Angeles because of all the COVID of stuff. So, of um, course. We, we somehow got the ambassadors of Malta to let us shoot over there. And um, it's John Lovitz, it's Jeff Fahey, it's um, David A.R. White, Beckman, and um, going to Malta to shoot an action movie during a pandemic is, is, is quite an adventure. Oh, I can imagine, I can imagine. And I mean, the work with the Baldwin, just alone, I mean, that's an iconic family. Yeah. Um, you know, with William, Alec, obviously, mm -hmm. SNL now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy, but you're just growing. And uh, one of the guys, I mean, that you were working with on this movie uh, was Burt Young. Uh -huh. If people don't know who this guy is, I mean, he's famous role. He's been in a lot of movies, but his famous role is Rocky. Yeah. And um, when I saw him, I'm like, oh, go Kira. I'm like, okay, because you're, you, what people don't understand that a lot of great actors and actresses they are in a lot of films that you may not realize as stars, mm -hmm. but and then when you pop out, let's say, because you're already on, on your way to possibly being a leading actor, and that's how you build, right? Mm -hmm. And then when people look back, because I've done that with Ben Affleck, I'm like, oh my God, Ben Affleck was in that movie. Mm -hmm. You know, and people are like, yeah, this is how the industry grows. You're, you're, their face is going to be more recognizable. They're growing on top of everything else they're doing. And then one day, Bam, she's going to be like the next Avengers superstar. And I'm going to be like, I know that girl. Yeah. She was in well, I've been, she was I've been the lead actress in a lot of mo little movies that nobody's seen. And I've been like a really small part in bigger movies. And, um, you know, I mm -hmm. got my start. I went, I went to drama school. I went to UCLA. I was an right. extra. I was a PA. I worked my That's way right. up. I got my union card on the original 90210. 
you know, I'm dancing girl number two, you know, <laughs> you know, when I, when I'm I 19 years myself. old. I used to love that show. Yeah. So. I used to love that show. Yeah. And I, I, I've worked my way up and, but, but also I like, I really like just continuing to be a working actress. Like I'm a normal person. I go about my day. Some people know me because they've seen my stuff. Other people don't like, it's not like the streets have to be shut down for me to go grocery shopping. Like I'm a normal person. But I'm also a working actress all my life, and like I haven't had a normal job for 30 years. And uh, we are all playing the violins for you right now. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> there are people out there like, yeah, I want to hear it, right? I got to get up at five in the morning, slap these burgers on the grill. I don't want to hear hey, it. I but did we've that all too, been but I did it. Yeah. I, I did it at an early age. I used to ride my beach cruiser over the 405 because I didn't have a car to go make muffins at 4.30 in the morning at Cali's Cafe and Bakery because I had a scholarship to UCLA, but I still had to pay my rent. You know? And then I started doing extra work, and then I started doing bit parts, and then, you know, Thank God for Playboy. I worked for them for 12 years as a host, as yeah. a producer, as a writer. Like, they got me through into my 30s paying, you know, they bought my first house. They taught me how to be a producer doing sex, et cetera. Um, sexy things to do before you die. Naked Happy Girls New York. You know, Howard Stern is a big promoter of me and, you know, in my book. Like, you know, thank God for all of that time of my life, because that's, you know, what paid the rent for years and years and years and taught me how to do what I do now. Yeah, we definitely got to talk offline because we have to go through a list of sexy things that we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I, I own that stuff because I did it and it, it, it makes me who I am. So. I love it. Which is awesome. Yeah. Well, let, let, uh, let, let's go through back and forth. A lot of times you probably watch my interviews. These interviews are a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's about getting to know the real you uh -huh. and not the drama you. And that's what a lot of people like. So I know you went to UCLA. Mm -hmm. What made you decide out of all the schools to go to decide to go to UCLA, especially in the drama department? Well, I was um, living in Idaho. I believe I was around 11 years old, 10, 11 years old. And, um, my family had just moved from California. My, my stepdad got a job up there and it was snowing. Like you could ice skate on the streets. I wasn't in school. And then I'm watching a football game on TV. It's UCLA versus USC. And there's mm -hmm. happy people in the sunshine in January. And I'm like, I want to go there. I don't know what that is, but I want to go there where the happy, pretty, smiling people are in the sunshine. Like seriously, that's how I got it in my brain. And we had just come from California and then moved. And I was like, I, I got to go back to California. Of course, I got sidetracked. My step family was from Louisville, Kentucky. I went to an arts high school in Louisville, which was great because that helped me get into the L.A. County High School for the Arts, which helped me get the scholarship to UCLA. But I saw it on TV and I said, I want to be there. And I also mm -hmm. said, I want to be in the TV. Like, I don't, I don't want to watch TV. I want, I want to get in the TV. Like, how do you get in the TV? I sort of knew because my mom, you know, from an early age, I said, I want to be on TV. And like, she got me on Romper Room when we lived in Northern California. And, and she got me a commercial agent. And I started doing modeling and commercials and stuff like that as a kid. But, you know, this was San Francisco, not LA. So it was a different, you know, venue for it. And then I went to um, acting school and dance school and drama school in, in Kentucky. And then, but I couldn't wait to get back to, to UCLA. And once I was there, I was in the thick of it. Like, I didn't even know where UCLA was, but it's in Bel Air, it's in Beverly Hills. Like, you're in Hollywood all of a sudden. And you know, you're going to school with the, the sons and daughters of producers and you're going, you're like, you like, you meet people, you start connecting and then, and also you just get to work, like you're in it. So you can go up, you can go to class during the day. I would wake up in the morning, ride my bike to go make muffins. I would then go to class or, or go to my rehearsal, but I also took some time off sometimes because I started getting work. Just being there and being willing, you know, and I would show up for 40 bucks a day or whatever it was to go be the extra on um, yep, Ferris too. Bueller's Day Off, Beverly Hills 90210, Parker Can't Lose, you know, all, all of those those kid shows that were on TV in the 90s um, got my start. Right. And you're naming all the shows that I grew up with just to let you know, yeah, I'm not. 
I'm I'm a, I'm no spring chicken. I just uh, <laughs> yeah. it's awesome just hearing all this. I'm loving it. I'm I was loving a regular it. Can... in, with Urkel on Family Matters, like I was in oh. his class. You know, <laughs> Th those were the days. <laughs> those are the best days. And I got to be honest with you, I love being an adult, but there are days where I miss not having any responsibilities and watching all the shows that you name, mm -hmm. where during school you look forward to Mondays because this is on and Tuesday is this is on. Yeah. And now it's just like... And we didn't Friday? have all these options or choices or streaming or DVRing. Like you had to show up and you had to be there and you had to watch it. It was, exactly. it was date TV. Exactly. exactly. Before we move forward, uh, first of all, I want to give some love to... Uh, a uh, red carpet host, TV host, and a friend of mine, Janet Zipper, Janet! Uh, along with, yes, and along with William Kidston mm -hmm. photography, because uh, those two are, are the reasons why we're connected right now. And, and I always show love to people that br bring people to me because they know they're going to get a good interview, but I don't like when people do favors for people or just do some of that kind of stuff at heart. Mm -hmm. And they never give them recognition for that. So Janet and Will, thank you so much for putting me with this lovely lady. Yeah. William lady. called me and he said, is it okay if I give this guy your number? And it was late at, or sort of late at night. And I was going to bed. I said, I'll, I'll talk to you in the morning. <laughs> so I looked you up. I saw your show. I saw how great it was and how many amazing guests you had, but also like your positive spirit and spin on things. Thank which is you. important to me. Like a lot, pe people call you up every day and they want to interview you and you don't want to do everything that comes your way. First of all, because, you know, it's a pandemic and we have to do our own hair and makeup and it's very strange and it's not, but also like you don't want to give your energy away unless it's something important. But um, I've known William for, um, I would say over 15 years. And he's, yeah, um, he, really he does a lot of charity events, you know, from, for the mm -hmm. Robert H. Lorsch Foundation. I met him through my yeah. late husband, Bob, and he mm -hmm. would do the, he still does the animal rescue events, the Thalians, Hollywood for mental health. He, 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 he shows up and, you know, and, and, and it really gives of his time. And of course, when I, I saw him and Janet on the red carpet for the Family Film Awards, they're like, we have somebody that we think you should meet. So that's how we, we hooked up. Um, yeah, and yeah. I appreciate that for that. And I'm so glad that, thank you, first of all, for staying out about the show. Um, it was a continuation of a show I did before the pandemic killed it. I was supposed to be syndicated here okay. in New York, and everything just went. Mm -hmm. So with Instagram, I'm like, you know what? I made a lot of great friends in all industries. Mm -hmm. Let me just do the one-on-one -on -one interviews. They don't have to go anywhere. They can still get a great interview, keep their faces relevant during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And people like you, John Amos, I'm talking to Tony Danza and all these other great people mm -hmm. and the show's coming back. And so, I love yeah, Instagram. I it's so user friendly. Like look how easy yeah. it was for us to connect. And now people yeah. are watching and but what what's great is it lives forever on Instagram. So it'll be on your site. People can come. It you know, it'll be it's anytime you do something like this, it it's forever. Yep, and I actually am in contact with the Instagram PR people from both Instagram mm -hmm. and IG. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really get into how that happened, but uh, they like the show. So we're, we're, okay. we're, things are like, you know, but um, I want to talk about the charities that you do, because mm -hmm. if you look me up, I'm a big giver back person, um, charity. I, I've been known to be seen with Ben Crump a lot, um, because I work with Keon Harold right now with Kia Got Ratio Profile. Um, plus I run New York City's Peace Concert. And the reason why I'm Maybe. saying all that to you is we have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely want to talk about the RHL group, okay, because it's a big, great group that you organized with your late husband, God rest his soul, years ago. But what I also loved about it is you guys give back to a lot of charities. So tell me about how you chose to do the Shelter uh, Hope Pet Shop will you give back to the pets? Because I think that's pretty amazing. Well, Shelter Hope Pet Shop is really the, the brainchild and the real love of my friend, my good friend, Kim, who I met in 1995 on a movie called Maui Heat. It was my very first movie that I did for Playboy. And we shot for three weeks in Maui. And I met her in the Playboy building in Beverly Hills, gorgeous blonde. She's like a Kim Basinger lookalike speaking of the Baldwins, um, and, and she, was, she, was, she was already cast, and she was playing the editor of the swimsuit edition, Maui Heat swimsuit edition. 
And I kept going in and auditioning and seeing Kim there and I was waiting with her and, and I was auditioning for like the swimsuit model or something. And here I am in my mm -hmm. combat boots and I had just gotten my hair grown out from being, you know, a punk rocker. I had purple hair, you know, purple mohawk. Like I was not a playboy girl. <laughs> so I'm like, why do they keep bringing me back with all these beautiful glamazons? And they, so on the, on the third callback, I'm there. And they said, well, we're not gonna cast you as the swimsuit model with Kim. We're gonna cast you as um, the makeup artist to the swimsuit models, because we think you're fun and you're a great actress and we're, we're gonna bring you along. So I met Kim on this movie, you know, in 1996. And, sent, and she always had dogs and she always had a little rescue. And then went about, um, in, in 2000, I think it was 2009, she actually created a, a nonprofit rescue pet store. She, she had been doing mm -hmm. the protest to stop the puppy mills. Um, yeah. and, and that you, they, you can't buy a puppy mill dog in LA anymore because of Kim. Right. Her name is now mm -hmm. Kim Sill. She married an executive music producer, Joel Sill, you know, any movie, you know, from Terminator to Forrest Gump, he's the movie, he's the music producer for like a, a big music guy. Okay. But it, it is her who does the actual work. And my little baby, Missy, Missy, come here. My little rescue dog, Missy, rescue is from dog. Shelter Hope. And um, I, I always like to support what they do because they get people into rescue dogs that would otherwise be euthanized. Mm -hmm. And they put them in a mall setting instead of like going to a scary shelter to get them adopted. So it's a dog don't shop, it's Shelter Hope Pet Shop. Um, we, we have a rescue dog of the week in the Beverly Hills Courier every week that's from Shelter Hope. And if we can save, you know, right. and I used to do the, um, the CBS, I was the pets to love lady, but I, this is my problem. I'm such a sucker. Like I wanna adopt, at one point I had seven animals cause I keep bringing them into my house. But I've realized you can't save everybody. So I just try yeah, to help other people save the dogs because I'm I'm full now. I've got I've got yeah. five animals. That's enough. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I avoid kennels or anything like that. I, I'm a huge dog lover. Uh -huh. um, hopefully, with what everything's going on, I'm looking to get a nice size home, and I want to step here in Husky like uh, like that. Yeah, well, that's well, shelterhopepetshop.org. Just say Kira sent you, and they'll get you whatever you want dog because they have right. connections all right. over the world and they get dogs flown in from Canada, from Mexico, from everywhere that don't have a home. And if you want a big dog like a Siberian Husky, Kim used to have Huskies, um, the, they'll find it. you the perfect dog. Yeah, I love them. Hopefully she can get me a puppy because I want to raise it like Yeah, a <laughs> like a baby. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just uh, those little things. That's why I avoid shelters. Because everybody knows <laughs> if you're not looking for a dog, you walk, right? You walk in and that dog's just like, he looks like a sucker. Everybody yeah. to the cage now. And yeah. they're like. But we are. It's not. Yeah. When your heart is open, I, they can tell. I can't, I can't even do that. Yeah. What, how did you develop the RHL group? Because you're a president now, correct? So what was the inspiration behind developing that? Well, the RHL group started out as a marketing company that my husband um, started years ago in the mm -hmm. 80s. Right. And um, mm -hmm. he, 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 was, he, he was a scrapper. He was a hustler. He never went to college. Right. You know, he, he developed um, marketing for the phone card for everybody, a company called Smart Talk. Back before, before people, everyone had a cell phone, there were phone cards. Mm -hmm. And people had them for the military, people had them for business, for traveling. He's like, why aren't they being sold at every 7-Eleven so everyone can have right. a phone card? So he developed a company that mass marketed phone cards and he sold it to AT&T for like a zillion dollars. You know, I, 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 yeah. I don't, I'm not good at math, but a lot of money because he, he did it yeah. in a very smart way, but he started from nothing. He started out, you know, selling cigarettes out of the back of his trunk, you know, and that's what I loved about him. Like nobody gave him yeah. money. He, he was right. like smart and a hustler and he made stuff happen. And when he, when we met in 2005, I was producing for, I was producing three shows for Playboy. We had mutual friends. I was like doing my own hustle. He was doing his own hustle. It took us a while to get together. But when we got together, he basically said, can you run the entertainment division of the RHL group? Because he, he had a, at one point a girlfriend who was doing a pet show. Then they broke up. Then I took over that. So then yeah. I could do the Shelter Hope thing. Um, 
he, some of his friends, like at Associated Television, who did the Daytime Emmy Awards and the Hollywood mm -hmm. Christmas Parade, they, they hooked up with me. So I would be their red carpet host or their backstage host for their events. And, um, and, and then I met the people on the Bay, the series, that um, my friend Devin DeVasquez from Playboy is married to Ron Moss from The Bold and the Beautiful, who was then on the Bay. I said, well, I'm an actress. Why aren't I on the Bay? I'm interviewing all of them at the Daytime Emmy Awards. So then I got, they wrote me a part in that show, um, which I was nominated for Best Supporting Actress on that show. And then I went on to produce that show for a couple of years. And we won Emmys, Daytime Emmys. So, um, you know, I think always just work that gets work. You know, so it started off with like me helping my husband with his marketing and his, his entertainment because that's the, where I came from. And it gave me a job besides just being a wife. You know, and then it made, helped me create my own avenue to keep doing what I'm doing. And um, even when he's gone, you know, he's left me that support system to to have that infrastructure to be able to keep doing what I'm doing and what I've always done, which is make movies and make TV. And, you know, my favorite thing is to work with my friends, you know, work yeah. with people you like. And um, that's how, you know, with the Beckman people, I, I'm on my third pro project with them now. We just did, we did Beckman, we did Love on the Rock. Um, we just, I just, I, I, I gave them their award at the Family Film Awards for finding love in quarantine for um, David A.R. White, his daughter Ocean, and Matt Shakira, yeah. the director. So it's like, you know, yeah. you, you, you find your circles, you know, that you keep going back to because those are the people who you work well with and you, you love and support each other. Yeah, and they're responsible for all the goodness that your future will behold if you keep that circle tight. Yeah. I agree with you 100% uh, about what you're doing. You, you sound like me, but better looking, <laughs> Hey, you're not but, so uh, bad, John. <laughs> and you yeah, are, you are uh, hilarious. You are a great, you're a great entertainer. And like, I've gotten so much feedback just from that parody that you made that I put up this morning with the Bay, the scene of me of Joe Connors and yeah. you playing opposite that. And even as the man's world turns, like you even like did a throwback to daytime in New York. Like it's like your, your attention to detail is impeccable. And you can tell that you're wow. really good at what you do. And just to do a radio show, you know, to put all this effort into it with all those those amazing details, you can tell like um, you really care about what you do. Yeah, I do. It's uh, I, I I guess you know what it is. It's how you found your passion is all your life when you're doing certain things. God has a way of whatever you believe in, fate mm -hmm. of destiny. And if you keep to that path, but keep who you are mm -hmm. you don't change who you are mm -hmm. what happens is people will start floating to you that you're eventually going to get to but you got to go through all the rough and the mire to get to those people and um i'm a middle child so i was always a wise ass i was always <laughs> a comedic person and i always like to have fun and me and my brother used to do skits when we were kids and people like God, you know what you're creating because this is what's happening now. You took Living Color, SNL, and Jimmy Fallon and put them all together mm -hmm. on the show. Because I have shows for month, for months to years. And to hear that from somebody like you and John Amos, days of the world, it's an honor because I want to give this industry, all industries, a real show that interviews not only the top A-listers of the world, but A-listers like you or who are at the top and all the ones from the past to give them a real show with original stuff and have fun, yeah. no drama. Because I don't want any drama no more. You know, <laughs> keep the drama in the closet. Keep it in the closet. You know, we all have skeletons, but you know what? I don't want to put a jacket on my skeleton and let them walk outside us so people see what my skeletons are. No, we want to put our best it. face forward and we want to put on a bright, shiny face that's inspirational and aspirational to everybody else because we're all dealing with our own demons. We're all dealing with our own nonsense. We're all dealing with our own stuff, but we, we don't need to put that out in the world. What we need to put out exactly. is, you know, how we keep going on. Exactly, exactly. And again, thank you so much. Yeah, on my tapes, I try to make my face and everything else look weird sometimes and this and that because I want to get in the character. But when I come on a show and I, you know, I got a nice guest coming on, you know, I got to take a Yeah, show, you got, you got to look nice. Up. Yeah, you got to do your thing. And I appreciate you sitting on the desk. Looking <laughs> the building, you know, I yeah, that. I'm not in my um, hoodie. I put on, I put on my red dress today. 
because that's what we need uh -huh. to do. And it feels good because we're, we're so used to this too. Like, you know, like I crave dressing up and going out and, 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 you know, being on the red mm -hmm. carpet and all those things or being interviewed by you. Like usually we go into a studio or I'd be in the lamb studios in New York doing this or, you know, like being amongst people. So we can't just give up and sit on the couch all day. You know, we, we've got to, you know, exactly. keep, keep getting up and getting on and getting our nails done. I got my nails done yesterday. It's nice. Uh, it, it, in LA, I don't know how it is in New York because I haven't been there for, for almost two years now, but like, we don't have, if I'm vaccinated, I don't have to wear a mask outside when I go walk on the beach. Yeah, me too. Yeah, well, it's great. Like, it feels a little bit like normal. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I went and had dinner inside the other night, which was like, oh, wow, that's cool. You know, like the little oh, things yeah. that we're so used to that's part of our life, you know, is coming yeah. back. And, um, you know, I can't wait to get on a plane and, and go somewhere and shoot a movie. I'm hope hopefully shooting a movie in, in Tennessee in a couple months. So, like, just, you know, oh, wow. to get back to life. Will be really nice. Yes, that would be amazing. Go to Tennessee. That would be great. Home of the country stars and the home. That would be amazing. Yeah, my sister I, I lives there. Amazing. She's getting married. Shout out to Christina. And um, oh, congratulations. Yeah, awesome. she's getting married. And um, my brother just flew out there. And um, you know, I, I love it that the world is getting back. Slowly but surely, and I'll be heading out to LA. Hopefully soon, because my brother lives in Palo Alto. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's there. that's near yeah. where I was born. I was born in Mountain View. Oh, you weren't born in Santa, Santa Clara? Santa Clara, Clara Mountain View is the city within Santa Clara. Yeah. You've Googled me, so you know. I do all my research on my guests. I make sure <laughs> there's a dead spot. There's no dead spots on my show. We just keep it flowing. Um, now, you were in New York. I wish I was here. Well, when you did get it, couple of co-stars when you came out of UCLA for NYPD mm -hmm. and then you also did ER correct you did mm -hmm. on that, which is really cool. how did you like uh, working with the cast of ER because I heard that cast was just phenomenal to work with. yeah they're really fast and I was I, w I was there in I think 2002 so George yeah. Clooney had already left I worked with Mackay Pfeiffer and um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, it was fun because I played the the shop owner of the trashy lingerie store in Hollywood, where someone had there was a murder or whatever. But I was the shop owner. I was the shop girl, um, and it was it was a fun little role. And then in NYPD Blue, I actually had a four episode arc because I was having an affair with Detective Ortiz's husband, and then I end up dead in a bathtub. And then, then I still get residuals from this because they keep, for the next two years, they keep flashing back to how I ended up dead. Like they, I was part of like, who killed Kira? Well, I forget my mm -hmm. character on the show. Who killed, you know, her? Who killed, you know, the woman who was yeah. having the affair? Um, so I, I still get residuals to this day from having this small part on, um, and, on NYPD Blue. And, and they were really great. And I actually lived... That was shot in LA on the Fox lot, not in New York, but it was shot in oh, LA on the Fox lot um, yeah. for, for those episodes. And I actually lived around the corner. So I could walk to the Fox lot, but they wouldn't let you in. You had to drive in with a car and show your credentials or whatever. So I showed up one day. I was like, oh, I just thought I'd walk over because it's only like, you know, six blocks away. And they're like, they wouldn't let me in. I'm like, but I was here yesterday working on that. And they're like, go get in your yeah, car and come gonna, back, which I thought was really what are you funny. Do? Like, like, can I get an Uber? They're like, where do you want to be dropped off? Um, it's kind of a weird request, but Around I need you to pick me up here and I need to drop, drop me off here at the same time. They're like, wait, what? So you just rent in a car, like, yeah, yeah, I just need you to go five feet so I can get in. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, let's do it. Yeah. And um, which is pretty funny. Now you're on the Bay. Congratulations on, like we talked about mm -hmm. before, being a producer, Emmy Award. How was the feeling to hold that in your hand, knowing that it was yours? Because that's one of the dreams of all actors, Emmys, Golden Globes, Oscars. Emmys is the high of TV. How was, yeah. when you got, when they called your name, was it like, like you, were you in awe? Like, wait, did they just call my name? How was that? Well, it, it's really fun, but it, it was also like a really, um, I don't want to say calculated move on my part, but I was already an actress on the show and they had been nominated and then they wanted me to produce. I said, well, I'll produce, but I want to be 
I, my husband made sure that I got a contract that said, if I help produce and get them sponsorship and really do the work, which I did, yeah. I will be one of the producers who wins the Emmy when they win the Emmy. Of course. So, I mean, that's, that's so, standard, of course. <laughs> so it was, it was sort of like, it's a really great show. I'm having a really good time being an actress, but as a calculated move, I want to win an Emmy because that gives you stature for the rest of your career. So even if That's I don't right. do anything else, I'll always be an Emmy winning actress, an Emmy winning producer. I'm an Emmy award winner. I'm a two time Emmy award winner. So um, I, I, I don't want to say I knew it was going to happen, but I expected it to happen because it was such a great show. Um, they were doing a really edgy thing on daytime, which was taking all the great stars, Gregory Martin, he, he recruited right. Wendy Rich from um, General Hospital to write, Christos Andrews and his sister Celeste were like the executive producers making this happen. There's a great guy, Anthony Aquino out of New York, who was also one of the executive producers. And you could tell they were really doing great stuff, but they also like, they really needed hands-on producers. And I come mm -hmm. from producing TV. Like I, like I can produ produce right. TV like the back of my hand. I'm like, what, you need extras? What, you need this? Okay, what? Like I would actually go in and make stuff happen. Like I think they maybe thought because I was Bob's wife or something that I would be like a, a producer by name only or find some sponsorships for them or whatever. But I was the one who was there at the craft service table feeding people. Like I like to hands on produce. If I'm going to produce, I'm going to I'm going to make sure everyone's happy. Hey, you want, you're a grinder. Yeah. yeah so like I'm there. I'm making stuff happen. So I did that for a couple of years. We won the Emmys. Um, but yeah, I wish I had them here. I'm actually in my, my, in my vacation home, um, down in South County, not in LA, um, by the beach in San Diego County. But, um, my Emmys are up in, up in LA and I have one on each end of my bookcase. They hold all, my, all of my favorite books and, um, and, and they're heavy so cool. and they're, they're worthwhile. And, but it also, it's like, it gives you, you don't have to have a chip on your shoulders anymore you know what i mean like you don't have to fight so hard you can because you can say like you have on my on my behind you kira reed lorsch emmy nominated actress emmy winning producer like you always have that for the rest of your life you know and yeah. and then i just won a family film award for my christmas movie i did and you know i'm, I'm looking forward to going to the can film festival with love on the rock and my horror film third floor and i Amity the Witches just came out this year. So like there's a whole other genre of horror movies and stuff that I never even got into until recently, but apparently I play a good witch. I'm in the middle. Yeah, we're, we're flowing right now because I was about to ask you that. Yeah. I love how this interview is going and I love that. By the way, I saw the trailer of Amityville Witches uh -huh. and I need to be with people to watch that film <laughs> because yeah, it freaked me out. <laughs> I don't like scary movies. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, uh, and I'm a, I'm a big guy, right? But when it comes to needles and horror films, I'm just, I'm one of these people like this, like, <laughs> like, you know, like the two fingers opening up is really going to help my fear, right? Right, <laughs> like, right. Hey, if I put the two fingers over my eyes, you're maybe safe. Won't be you're so safe. Bad. You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> the good news is I'm not the bad witch. And I, and I helped develop the storyline. I, I started it off as the Bell Witches, three good witch sisters. And they made it scarier. Um, and then there's the bad evil queen witch we're, that we're, you know, fighting against the evil. Um, but we're, we're, it's, it's a good versus evil story. I'm a good witch. The good news is at the end of the, at the, end of the thing, there's, there's some blood. There's some virgin sacrifices, but I don't have to do it. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, you know what? I can't even act those sport. parts. You know, I can't even watch a, a, like a commercial for Law and Order before I go to bed. SVU, it's too, it's too scary. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I was watching that, and then I'm seeing, I'm seeing what you're doing because a lot of actors do this as they grow into their real craft. It takes a long time to really grow into becoming a great actress. And you're moving around, which is awesome. And then I saw the trailer for Rumors, and I'm like, okay, so this has got a little evilness to it, but it's more like drama that a lot of girls go through a lot. And yeah. what I like about the trailer, you know when it's going to be a good movie when the trailer doesn't show all the good parts. Yeah. They keep you in suspense. I tell people that. You want to know a good movie? 
Watch a trailer that keeps you in suspense and keeps you curious. That's a good movie. And a movie that you can guess right off the bat is because they showed all the good parts because the movie ain't that great. I hear so, you. When I watch rumors, I'm like, okay, all right, Kira. I see, yeah. I see what you're doing there. I Tell hooked, me about that. I hooked like up with the rumors kids. They're all in their 20s. And my friend Vincent yes. DePaul, who I met on the Bay, and he played my brother in Beckman, and um, we're friends. But he hooked me up with these kids, and they were looking for someone to play the acting teacher. So, um, and, and I had an acting teacher in my 20s when I came to LA, and they said they don't want the typical over the top acting teacher, kind of, you know, convoluted type, you know, of a person. They said they wanted a mother figure. And I, and I just came off Beckman playing an assassin and a crazy person and a human trafficker. And, I, and then I did Witches where I was a wit. Like I wanted to play just a nice, normal person. And um, I'm, 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 they've just put, we're in festivals now with rumors. It's either gonna be a feature film or a series depending on who buys it and distributes it or both. But it's in the Indie right. Series Awards and I'm up for Best Supporting Actress and, and um, they said what what was really nice about it is that it's it's a young person's story, but we have the older my point of view, like the next generation's point of view as well. So it's really it's a twenties story, and it's and it has um, and 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 it's also about non-binary love. And I don't get all these terms right: LGBTQ. X, Y, Z, you know, I, I don't even know, but whatever works for you, I'm a supporter of. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the girl who wrote this, um, she plays the lead character who's struggling with her identity and her sexual identity, and also like her identity in, in the world as a creative person. And, and she's also such a great artist. She wrote this, she produced it, she did all the music for it, she sings in this. Um, Nicole Waranek, we have to be on the lookout for her, and um, she's going to sweep us, you know, in this coming year when rumors comes out. But um, I'm just, I'm just happy to be a part of it, and also I'm one of the executive producers, and an RHL group is my company yeah. is um, is co-producing it with them to help 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 them get that message out in the world that you can be different, and and have a voice and do whatever it is you want to do. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. And I can't believe it's already been almost 40 minutes already. This are you timing like... this? No, I, I have to. <laughs> are we Are we there yet? yet? <laughs> talk. Yeah. No, you don't understand. Like, I could talk to you for hours, but I, you know, I got studio people. They always look at me and they give me signals. And sometimes I want to flip them the bird and be like, get up. <laughs> but um, first of all, I'm, I'm loving this story of yours. You're doing a lot. I should just have you produce your show and we'll just stick this right before Jimmy Kimmel and beat a brand new talk show coming out. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just throwing a plug in there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about, and I'm sure you talked about it before, you've had such a great successful career. Just keep climbing. And I want people to understand in order to climb, you got to grind, right? In order to climb, you got to grind. That's what you've been doing. Uh -huh. How did you get hooked into the, the Playboy, uh, that whole entourage? Because I spoke with Felipe Rose, who's coming on the show tomorrow. You might have met him because the village people played at the, the mansion. Yeah. And he kind of remembered you. He's coming on tomorrow. Okay. So that's why I'm loving how this, you know, these two days are ending. How did you get hooked into that whole atmosphere? Because that's a, that's a great atmosphere to really work in. People don't even understand it. Yeah, well, I never, you know, it, it's it's a little bit strange because, you know, Playboy is something that I knew of when I was at UCLA and the Playboy Mansion was in the same neighborhood as the UCLA campus. Like I would drive my bike, you know, ride my bike around and like stop and look and be like, oh, this is the Playboy Mansion and see the statues and the, the, the bushes would talk to you, ma'am, can I help you? I was like, oh, I was just looking. And um, before I knew anything about Hugh Hefner, I knew that he gave a million dollars the year that I was at UCLA for film preservation for, yeah. for the archive at UCLA. I also knew him because he was a civil rights activist. You know, Playboy After Dark, his, his Playboy clubs, he would like let the, the black people in the front door when, when, you know, the musicians weren't supposed to be playing in the clubs at all. 
you know? That's right. So I, I always respected him as a civil rights activist. And when um, I actually, when I, I did the movie where, where I met my Kim, the Shelter Hope Pet Shop lady, um, mm -hmm. Maui Heat, it was actually in the UCLA Bruin. There was an ad for, you know, actresses wanted for a Playboy production shooting in Maui for three weeks, you know, need, need actresses, need to be comfortable, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I want to do that. So that's how I got hooked up with it. it. First of all, it was my neighborhood. Second of all, I respected Hugh Hefner. Third of all, I was not the type. <laughs> and I was like, how, but also like, even um, my family and um, my stepdad, you know, when I said I was thinking about doing this, they're like, well, as long as you raise the consciousness level of whatever you're doing, like right. it can be pornography or it can be art. It can be whatever you make right. it. So I chose to make it like, the, I'm, I can make this my art and I'm good at this. I'm comfortable with this. Um, after doing some movies with Playboy, I, I got the editor turned me on to Zalman King, Red Shoe Diaries. Um, I did some movies with them. Then they were looking for a host for their travel shows, et cetera, which I ended up mm -hmm. hosting, writing, producing for 12 years. Then I developed their show with Ross Dale and Frank Martin at 11th Day Entertainment. Um, right. 69 Sexy Things to Do Before You Die, the travel show for couples. And I was part of the executive team at Playboy making TV for two. I would be one of the only women there or, or the only woman there with Christy, um, Christy Hefner, to create um, erotica that both men and women would like to watch. So right. I always felt like, and I was always treated like a queen. I never had a Me Too moment at Playboy. I had it in real Hollywood where someone would put their hand on your knee and you'd be, take it and you'd put it over here and you'd say, don't touch my knee. That's as far as anybody yeah, ever got with me. I said, don't touch my I knee. Take your hand it. off my leg. I never understood that too. Because when you're in a business meeting, I have a lot of respect for women. I mean, my mother was a, a huge inspiration to me. I never understood when you're in a meeting, whether you're with an attractive woman or not, I always think of, if I'm in a meeting with a guy, am I going to put my hand on his knee? Maybe. No. I don't so know. Like, but then you're, then you're getting you out of business mode and into some other kind of mode. And it can be men. It can be women. But it's a power thing. It's a weird thing. And I never yeah. had that at Playboy. They treated women with the utmost respect. Because you had to right. treat women with respect because they were the ones who were making all this happen and making... And you had to be so comfortable. Like I was in the magazine in 1996. You know, I'm, you know, half naked in the bathtub with Arnie Crytype shooting me. I looked amazing. But you know, if if anybody treated me bad, I wouldn't have been able to be comfortable doing that. You know what I mean? Right. And then I went on right. to be one of their executives and one of their producers and all of that. So, um, I really like the legacy that I had with Playboy because to just to be part of Hugh Hefner's dream and to be part of, um, you know, freedom of speech. And also, um, and some people may think of it as something that's some, somehow against women. I always thought of it as like, so pro woman. And um, to be able to use my womanliness to, you know, get ahead in the world and to um, also, um, you know, it gave me a stepping stone to everything else that, that I do now. I learned how, and I produced for E, I produced for Discovery, I produced for Travel Channel, from everything I learned producing for Playboy. It's all the same canon. It's all the same, like, right. you know, the same mm -hmm. system. But then I was hired to do other shows, you know, for, for News Magazine. Which is amazing. Yeah. And you're obviously going into the behind, even though you're, you're in front of the scenes, you're doing what a lot of actors do because there's such a world out there when you tap into being a producer, for example. Um, you now have a little power in the movie, which is great. Um, have you ever thought, and I'm sure you have, or maybe it's in the work about possibly directing a film? That's a whole different world. You know, I, I'm really good at being a producer. I'm a natural born producer. I'm a really great organizer. I'm a really good people person. I'm great at seeing the problems and solving the problems. I think and, and I could hire a great cinematographer, a great DP, and be a director if I ever so choose. But there are better people than me who see that right. artistic vision. And when I watch directors mm -hmm. direct, and I've worked with some really great directors, you know, Toby Hooper, yeah. um, 
Bob Zemeckis, you know, I, I've worked with some really, when, when I watch them direct and how they see things, I don't see that. Like, I, I, I know, my, I kind of know my wheelhouse. That doesn't mean I might not want it. I'll do it someday. And I've directed little things. I've directed shorts. I've directed things for charity. I've directed, you know, the Thalians honoring Hugh Hefner at the, at the Playboy Mansion um, and, and Smokey Robinson at the House of Blues. Like, I've directed some things, but only things that I'm really passionate about because I, I think directing is a whole different kind of artistic eye. Um, oh, yeah. And not that I don't... Yeah. I just think there's better people. Like, like I'm like you. You give me an iPhone or something, like I can barely work it. Like I think, <laughs> you know, and especially in this technological kind of age that we're in, okay, right, like you've right, got right. to really know um, the equipment you're working with and the lenses and you know the the vision. You know, like I would never be able to like find the perfect shot. I think is 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 good as someone else. So I would rather produce. I would rather hire the greatest director than direct until I feel, until I, until I can see that vision. Yeah. And I'm glad you're kind of saying that because a lot of people don't recognize, recognize where their wheelhouse is or stay in their lane. You're obviously somebody who knows people, right? You can judge people and who's good at what you're a problem solver. But then, like you said, with directors, directors are really great content creators, meaning that they could take a scene, and while everybody's looking at one thing, they may see something in the corner of their eye and mm -hmm. be like, wait, wait five minutes. They're like, what? Because if the sun goes down over there yeah. and it hit her perfectly, ready, go. And uh -huh. that takes somebody who is really passionate, who's a story creator, yeah. who's a content creator. Yeah. Um, I understand that 100%. And obviously the editor has to come into play. Mm -hmm. And I like that. So you owning your own group. Yeah, I mean, one day if you own your own film house, you can actually be the person to bring in all these great people and make a movie that you want, mm -hmm. but put the great pieces together. So mm -hmm. instead of it being an enigma, you took a jigsaw puzzle and you solved it. Yeah. And I think that's what you're good at. And also when, when you're a, a television producer, a news producer, a segment producer, you are the director. Um, so you right. are the producer of a, a TV news segment is the director. They're telling the camera guy what to do. They're writing the piece. They're putting the shot together. So I've been mm -hmm. a director in the sense of, you know, directing, but they call it a showrunner or a producer when it's yeah, news. Showrunner. So for, mm -hmm. for a film, um, I, I have not done that. I have not been the artiste, the director, you know, but <laughs> oh, I would rather have someone else do that. They can, they can be, they can stay up all night worrying about, you know, that perfect shot. Yeah. And, and it's really tough. And I'm actually getting into that. Um, I'm working with Casey Amos, John's son. Uh, yeah. Casey just shot Tiffany Haddish's video. So we have something in the works right now in terms of film. So I'm getting into that. And that's why I'm always asking actors, have you thought, because I'm noticing more great actors are more going into directing now and producing. Mm -hmm because they want to expand their horizons. Mm -hmm. And I think you're doing that in so many great fields. But like I said, I love the fact that you found your link, mm -hmm. right? You're a business, at the end of the day, you're an actress, but I think you're also a great business one, great business person, um, because it seems you know exactly when you see something, you get it, you go for it. And yeah. that's a grind that people need to know. That's that old school grind. That's what I love, that old school grind. Yeah, I also um, like making money, Todd. Yeah. I like making money. Oh, so I, I don't no, mean like me like like an art project just to have an art project. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like Beckman. We were hoping it would come out in theaters, but Beckman is doing so well. I love it that, you know, my deal with them as one of the co producers, you know, with RHL group, Universal is distributing it and bought it. But we also had the great um Pure Flicks. We had a distribution company behind it already. So like to find the deals that are the good deals to me is fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's Cause I don't want to have to get on my bike and cross the 405 and go make muffins at 4.30 in the morning. I want to act in movies and make good business deals. So for me, yeah. like for me, like I'm all about like the numbers and the like, how's this going to make, are we sure this is like, it's not for me, it's not the perfect shot. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it, can we sell it? 
<laughs> Two. And I like you it. know. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you can't be an actor unless you're putting food on the table. So exactly. I 100 percent agree with you on that. You can't live a passion. You that's why they have the phrase starving artist. People don't understand. Starving artist is somebody who's trying to do their passion, but they're not bringing in money. And that's I don't why want I would to say keep day job. Yeah, I I, yeah, I want caviar, darling. I want caviar artists, not starving artists. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I want some cash. At least That's good DoorDash cool. artists. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I can go for that caviar, little bazooka, <laughs> little crackers, little, little little seafood towels. Mm -hmm. you know? That's what I'm talking about. You get, you get me hungry, girl. I mean, this whole entire, it's almost this whole time. Interview, yeah. I, this whole entire interview, I'm like, wow, you know. Me being blue, you wearing red. I'm like, this is the coolest Republican Democratic debate. It's America, time. darling. <laughs> <laughs> so where can we, where can people see um, Beckman if they want to watch it? I know Universal has it. Is it being distributed? Yeah, Uni Netflix? All Access. You can buy it at Walmart. Um, you can stream it on Amazon Prime. Like it, it's everywhere. Um, also, mm -hmm. Amityville Witches is on Amazon and Walmart. You can buy it. Um, Acts of Desperation, which, you know, your New Yorker, Paul Sorvino, he plays my chief of police. I also executive produced this movie. Um, I play the bipolar, suicidal um, sidekick girlfriend to the bank mm -hmm. robber, of course. Um, because like because, because it's not like boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Sounds my like friend Vince my Lozano, girlfriend. who brought me this script, we were in acting class 20 years ago, and he um, has a cameo in Promising Young Woman. So look for Vince in Promising Young Woman, which is, of course, you know, just went through the Oscar season, and he's so great in that. And um, But it's they're everywhere. But, of course, Amazon and Walmart are the places to go. They're the biggest one. So, Kira, I'm, I'm so honored to be able to interview you today. Um, I always tell people in a lot of my interviews, the only downfall I have with interviewing people, when I get into such a great conversation, I can talk to you for hours. But unfortunately, that's not the way things go. We'll and do it I again sometime. We're going to do it again because the way this is going, I will have a studio audience and I would love to bring you in right. and have a big audience and do it the whole nine. Um, but congratulations on everything that you're doing, uh, especially with the production side, producing great, great actors. I'm definitely becoming a fan. Uh, definitely going to watch back, man. I think it's a great, great movie, and I love the cast involved with that. Now, guys, if you don't know, I'm speaking to Kira Reed, Lord, uh, Lorsch, Porsche. <laughs> you can follow her on Instagram. Um, again, Kira, thank you so much. You are a pleasure to interview today and a pleasure to talk. To Thanks, you Todd. Much. So great to meet you and good luck with all of your work. You're doing a great job. And thank you. So guys, while she's on coming up tomorrow, we have a legend coming in. Uh, we have music icon and former and original member of the Village People, Mr. Felipe Rose is going to be in the house. And then we're going to end the season. We're going to end the season on Sunday. I got a special thing we're doing, DMX's people hit me up and they want to come on my show and talk about the memorial. So I'll be speaking with the team who drove that monster truck here and they want to end my season here, which is great. And thank you to Kira. Thank you to all the guests that have been on. It's been such a great week and I can't wait to do season two. And I can't wait to you know meet you in person because you just have a lot of great energy that I wanted to rub off on me as well. I think it's awesome. I really do. We're going to talk. We're going to talk offline. So, guys, thank you for watching FaceTime with Todd Warden. You can follow me at Todd Warden Official. I interview celebs five days a week. And as I always say at the end of the show, if you're not living a passionate life, then whose life are you living? Guys, have a great night, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, Kara.